<laughs> Thank you, Justin. So welcome to VAMP, everybody. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh-oh, I'm touching my face. Um, <laughs> come back with the Lysol, please. Um, we are very, very happy to have everyone back at VAMP and you at home also. Uh, we are so excited. It is VAMP's glorious resurgence. And uh, even though our environment is a little bit different, we feel that this is the first step back to a normal, quote unquote, VAMP. Uh, what we have here tonight is mixed bag, as you may know. What we've done is we've assembled performers from March and April who didn't get to have their uh, regular VAMP experience. We've assembled them together and we've brought them here in our super secret location and we're bringing them together for a show for you tonight. And just so you know, we are following uh, CDC protocol. When any, whenever someone is not on stage, they are wearing a mask and we have everyone sitting six feet apart from each other, so we're all good on that front. Um, 2020 has really been a pretty terrible year, and we've been missing our in-person shows. We've all been missing them. Uh, we've been missing our close contact, but at least you can't blame So Say We All if you haven't gotten laid yet. <laughs> uh, thanks, COVID. So, we are hoping that things will start to change soon. Cross your fingers. We are, uh, so Say We All is continuing our streaming programming and uh, we've reopened VAMP submissions. So we want you to please submit to VAMP. Uh, check out the website, so sayweallonline.com and see what shows you would like to submit to. We also would love for you to submit to public access. Public access is exactly what it sounds like. It harkens back to the 80s and 90s heydays of public access TV. You can submit a video, a music video, you doing stand-up, you reading a story, any sort of thing like that. So check that out online also, and please send us your submissions. We also have Long Story Short coming back. Uh, we're doing that via Zoom. We'd love to have you participate in Long Story Short. Check that out on the website too. That's coming up first week of June. Um, now, I know it's really, really hard to stay positive these days with all that's going on in the world. We have uh, continuously bad news day in and day out, but here at So Say We All, we do still believe in good, and that is why we're here. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and so for th with that, uh, I just want to start the show and... I want to tell you who our performers are going to be tonight. And let's go ahead and give them a hand. We are going to start with Gabby Gonzalez. We have Laura Brooks, Ginger Nocera, David Schmidt, Ariana Krieger, and Haley Rutledge. So let's kick things off with Gabby Gonzalez. I went to therapy for mental health and left with a prescription for masturbation. <laughs> Directions, use in the privacy of your bedroom to achieve pleasure. Nudity is optional. Recommended quantity, as much as you can handle. Active ingredients, dopamine. Oxytocin, when and if climax is reached. Warnings for new users, risk of obsession. <laughs> well, at 20 years old, when I told my therapist I'd never been kissed, she assumed there might also be a number of other things I'd never tried, masturbation being one of them. And she was right. <laughs> Having attended all-girls Catholic school during my prime years of puberty, I learned about sex and my body from a 60-year-old nun. Unlike most of the other girls I went to school with, I respond well to authority and was successfully indoctrinated by our abstinence-only sex education. I was a good student of the Catholic faith and learned very quickly that sex, sexiness, promiscuity, red meat on Fridays during Lent, and self-pleasure were not only wrong, 
but worthy of embarrassment. As a teenager, I denied myself any urge, whether it was to hump my pillow or to make out with my hand, pretending it was the lips of the track team captain at the all-boys school across town. So, by the time I was sitting in my therapist's office, my vagina understandably felt foreign to me. I didn't know what it looked like or where it was. I had never used a tampon because my mother believed tampons might break my hymen, which to her meant losing my virginity. But there I was, leaving my therapist's office with a strong recommendation that I consider touching myself, exploring what gives me pleasure. I felt so unequipped. I felt like I was being sent to battle with nothing but a boomerang in hand. At the same time, my therapist's recommendation came by no surprise. I was recovering from anorexia, a disorder that, among many other things, stunts sexual development. I knew that this was part of the work, part of finding freedom. So, feeling overwhelmed by what felt like a gargantuan task, I went home, sat in bed with a pint of ice cream, and opened my browser. I typed the words, how to masturbate for women. <laughs> to my surprise, I found something that wasn't porn. I paid www.omgyes.com a one-time fee of $29 to teach me how to masturbate. I got access to research-based masturbation techniques from people with a vulva. I learned about things like edging, hinting, framing, accenting, layering, staging, orbiting, and signaling. I was mind blown by all these things I'd never fathomed and honestly still don't understand. <laughs> when it came time to try these things, these techniques on myself, I couldn't do it. I couldn't touch myself. I was afraid that masturbating would reveal something about me that didn't fit inside the box I'd neatly squeezed myself into. I was bred to be a well-behaved, submissive girl who pleases others and has no needs. I'd worked really hard to mold myself into this ideal, and having desire threatened that too much. If I touched myself and felt nothing, then I'd learn I was damaged. But if I touched myself and actually liked it, I might turn into some sort of untamed beast that moans and groans and asks for things to be done to her. <laughs> I was so ashamed of touching myself and equally as ashamed of not knowing how to touch myself. I was trudging in what purity culture had so well inculcated in me, wishing that I could live into the embodiment of sex-positive feminism. I wanted to be like the female characters in Girls in Broad City, who were open to casual sex and trying kinky things. I wanted to feel like I could wear lacy lingerie and whisper naughty things. I wanted to seduce. In my final hopeless pleas for an answer from the internet, I turned to the canon of all things female teen pleasure. Yeah. Cosmo Magazine. <laughs> Cosmo had an article on vibrators for beginners that made me realize I could purchase training wheels for my hands. <laughs> I immediately ordered an inconspicuous bullet vibrator which would be delivered to my door in discreet packaging in five days time. <laughs> when it arrived, I was nervous but mostly excited to try it. This was going to be an event. I put my favorite playlist on, lit a candle, and laid in bed with my new vibrator and one lucky double A battery. <laughs> I switched it on and was abruptly put off by its roaring buzz. But once I learned to adjust its power levels, I was transformed into a liberated woman. I started masturbating once a day, then I moved to twice a day and later started doing it when I woke up in the afternoon and again before bed. I started to notice that it was helping me sleep better. It cleared all my thoughts and made me focus on just one thing, me. It's like the best mindfulness practice ever. I got so hooked that I'd masturbate over and over again, trying to see how many orgasms I could fit into one session. I maxed out at five. Sometimes I made excuses for not being able to stay at my boyfriend's place so I could masturbate. <laughs> when I went home for the holidays, I'd risk it, despite my lockless door. And when my mom did barge in, 
I yelled at her for entering, but really I was yelling her at her to cover up the buzz sound. <laughs> While traveling in South America post-college graduation, I got creative. I stayed in shared dorm rooms at hostels. So when the perfect conditions were aligned, everyone out partying, street music coming in through the open windows, the fan blowing on high, and lights out, I'd crack out the good old vibrator. Things came full circle when my travels led me to a work exchange in southern Peru. I spent two months living with Catholic nuns and masturbated every night. Just, just one thin wall away from the place they prayed daily. I was obsessed and nothing was stopping me. Not the thin walls, not my mom, not the Catholic nuns, and not the insecurities of the men in my life who hated that I used a vibrator in their presence. My vibrator made me feel good. It made me feel like I could create the things I wanted in my life for myself. Those were things like hobbies and friends and traveling around the world by myself for a whole year. This small, battery-operated toy cemented a leap forward in my recovery. I'd given myself permission to experience pleasure, and not only orgasmic pleasure, but also the pleasure of laughing again, of skipping in the rain, or of enjoying a piece of cake guilt-free. When I went back to my therapist and admitted that I developed an affinity for my vibrator, <laughs> I also shared that I feared this type of pleasure was manufactured and somehow less authentic. And in response, she said, Pleasure is pleasure, and there's no righter or wronger way of getting there. Her words affirmed my power and worth. They dissolved my shame about this obsession and helped me realize that no lover of mine was going to make me feel badly about how I achieve pleasure. And even though my hobby has lessened over time, it still plays a role in my sex life. When a man came into my life and said the words, bring out your vibrator, I think it's so sexy. I knew I'd found my match. Someone who made space for me, for himself, and my buzz in the bedroom. <laughs> yeah! Happy The doctor says to me, you have adenoid cystic carcinoma. The lump in your tongue is cancer. No lube, just shoved it right in. She says, you had a better chance of winning the lottery and being struck by lightning than you did of getting this particular cancer. I've always been adventurous. Some would say reckless and maybe a little crass and brassy. But overall, I love hard and I'm loyal as fuck. And now, a new label, cancer patient. The kind that doesn't get a remission the kind that has a horrible survival statistic at around 15 years. She figures that I've had it for about 11 years. The treatments, radiation, and chemo won't work. Fuck, fuck, fuck. My parents are with me in the waiting room. My mom crumbles into my dad and tells him. He's just so quiet. I call my husband first, maybe expecting him to have some kind of wise words, some kind of don't worry, we've got this kind of pep talk, but he too is quiet. We hang up. When I call my sister from the car, she gives me a few reassuring words, but I hear her fear, so we hang up. And the car ride home is just so quiet. I sit in the quiet, not sure if it's meant to be a protective bubble, a way of avoiding speaking this thing, making it more real. The next day is my son Riley's 21st birthday. We drink. While well, I keep trying to pretend that everything is normal, but I cry when I walk with my son on a dark beach. Through tears, I tell him that I'm sorry for ruining his birthday. I think about missing his or his brother's future birthdays, missing my husband's birthday, our anniversary. We are a close family. We celebrate together and love each other fiercely. And I'm supposed to be their fearless leader. In their worlds, I'm the rock, the English prof who's stern but motherly, the badass, the one who plans and takes care of shit. Now for the first time, I wonder who will take care of me. The day before the first radiation session, I'm fitted for the mask. 
The mask is meant to hold my face and head still so they can target my tongue without scorching anything else. The fitting turns the room into a medieval torture chamber. As I lie on the table, the radiation techs put a block of wood tied to two straps under my feet and put each of the straps in my hand. I'm meant to stretch my legs, forcing my shoulders down so the mask can get a tighter fit. They also give me a tongue depressor that has a dense spongy material on it, kind of like a fake lollipop. It's, it takes up most of the inside of my mouth and it makes me gag. I practice deep breathing to try to calm myself. The techs plunge some webbed material in a warm water bath, pull it out and stretch it quickly over my face, head, neck and shoulders, clasping it to the table in five different places. The mask takes a long time to dry and I fight the urge to scream, to cry, to claw at it and rip the thing off. So I go through radiation five days a week. Each day, a different rads buddy, as I call them, goes with me. My first rads buddy is my husband, then my parents, then a long list of family, colleagues, and friends. I am radiated, scorched. It burns like hellfire. At times, it hurts so very bad to talk. I rely on a magic my mouthwash of a lidocaine mixture to numb the pain so I can lecture in class while I'm going through treatment. I drive to campus, drink some liquid codeine in the parking lot of my car, walk to class, and before entering, rinse my mouth out with the magic, spitting it into the bushes outside the classroom. I sleep with a humidifier, but still wake up each morning to cough and gag out slug-sized mucus. I manage. And then about halfway through treatment, after one of my scans, they find a mass on my kidney. Another cancer. Fuck, fuck, fuck. The doctor agrees that I need to wait until I'm done with the radiation I'm currently receiving to have the surgery to remove the mass of a chunk and a chunk of my right kidney. We plan the surgery for December when the semester's over. So on I go, scorching my tongue. I envision the radiation as Ripley from Aliens with a blowtorch, head tilted, blasting away all those alien mama's eggs. I just want to blast the shit out of this cancer. Along the way, I lose my sense of taste. Food nauseates me. I can only tolerate and sure. I don't yet know that I'll never be able to taste sweet again, even though I will still get some of my taste back. After comforting myself with baked goods, chocolate and ice cream for most of my life this really fucks with me and it really makes it difficult to handle what lies ahead i finished radiation on october 5th my rad's buddies watch me ring the ceremonial bell and then drive my sister's giant diesel over that godforsaken torture device of a radiation mask but no matter how many times i run over that thing it bounces back to shape demon spawn. Still, I feel some relief because the urologist has convinced me that the cancer on my kidney can be cured with surgery, even though the adenoid cystic carcinoma, ACC, will always be there. The ACC lurks in my body waiting. I walk around every day knowing that there's something in my body that wants me to die. I carry that around every damn day, but I manage. And then, a few weeks later, the end of October, my dad starts vomiting. I bring over Sprite and Lysol. My mom wants to kill the germs in the house. I think he's caught the stomach flu that's going around. At urgent care, they see that he's severely dehydrated, so they send us to the ER. They run some scans of his gut to see if there's a blockage. Then they x-ray his chest. And then they tell us they're sending him for a CT of his brain. It becomes very clear that this isn't the flu. They say they're admitting him and tell us that they're taking up to the fifth floor, taking him up to the fifth floor. And then I know my friend's mom had been on the fifth floor when she died from cancer. At almost midnight, the doctor comes to tell us that my dad's skin cancer treated about five years prior, has metastasized to his lungs and brain. The vomiting is from the cancer, which gives him vertigo. They want to try radiation. They'll look into immune therapy. I mean, after all, it helped Jimmy Carter. 
In the early days following his diagnosis, my dad is himself sometimes. He whispers I love yous and talks to my boys. He eats and drinks the milkshakes I bring him from Cold Stone. He's just retired. My parents sold their house to buy an RV and travel the country together with their golden retriever, Bailey. The house, the hub of our family, is empty, gone. My dad is in the hospital. It isn't fair. None of it is fair. Does this take my mind off my own countdown clock? Maybe. Maybe I can see my future and what he's going through. Maybe willing him to fight this is willing myself to keep moving forward. Some days I sit and grade papers in his dark hospital room while he lies still. One day he tells me that he's worried about my youngest. He says, I'm really worried about Jason. I was his age when my grandpa died and it was really hard on me. I don't wanna have this conversation with him because I'm not ready to live in a world without my dad in it. I don't answer. I sit in the quiet. He knows I'm there and I'm quiet. I'm relieved when my sister shows up soon after. I tell him I love him and I leave. This is one of the last times that he's able to initiate a conversation and I don't engage. I can still, still hear my own silence. My dad stops talking shortly after. We must move him to a rehabilitation facility. We choose one with a Christmas tree. Christmas is his favorite holiday. He doesn't talk to us. He cries in pain. He winces at our touches and refuses medication and food. He says mean things that he would never have dreamed of saying before all of this. We're watching him die while I'll be home for Christmas plays in the hallways. I cry as I feed him his medication disguised in applesauce. When he returns to the hospital because of a high fever, we make the most difficult decision of our lives. We go against his wishes and place a do not resuscitate on his file. He has always been against it, citing the Star Trek movie when Bones agrees to pull the plug on his dad only to find a cure shortly after. My dad always said that we should do whatever it takes to keep him alive, but this isn't a life. So they stabilize him and decide to release him a few days later to go home with hospice. No one tells you that when you place that DNR, they ask you the most terrible questions. Do you want us to offer ventilation when he stops breathing? No. Do you want us to do chest compressions when his heart stops? No. It feels so goddamn wrong to stop fighting for someone you love to stay alive. I feel like I'm betraying the fight against this shared enemy called cancer that I have sworn to vanquish. Now I'm acknowledging that he can't win and it breaks me. He sleeps in a morphine days in the apartment my mother has found. The hospice nurse comes. We stay there with him at various times over the next few days. My mom plays Christmas music for him all day and night. On December 7th, I go to see my dad before my kidney surgery. I tell him I love him and that I'm gonna be okay. I stroke the wispy hair on his forehead and I tell him not to worry about me because I'm strong. And I promise him that I won't be long until I'm back here by his bedside. I say all this through tears. I swear I see his eyelids flutter and I feel him there, loving me. I hold his hand, kiss his forehead, and whisper I love yous, and slowly walk out the door. The surgery goes okay, and my husband is there before and after. I have drainage tubes and I can't sit up. The pain is intense. They tell me I'll be there a few days recovering, and I send visitors, including my husband, home so I can float in and out of the drug haze. I don't like to be seen in such a vulnerable state. But my great friend Leslie insists on coming to see me two days later. I found out later that my husband has sent her to me. She's with me when my husband calls. Through his tears, he tells me that my dad is dead. I wail as Leslie holds me. It's the worst pain I have ever felt. Wounds at my core are open and aching and waves of, heart, waves of heartache mixed with this bodily pain to create a soul sore that feels appropriate. My physical pain is woven together with the emotional pain to form this stabbing, throbbing, 
all-encompassing desolation within every fiber of my being. I say goodbye to my dad a few days later when our family gathers in the mortuary to see his body before cremation. There will be a wake, but this is for us. I touch him and talk to him and kiss him and I don't wanna leave. I will forever be haunted that I wasn't with him when he died. The past two years have been filled with the first without him. Each first without him is a reminder of what could have been, what he would have said or done, and it hurts my heart, but I manage. I think some, day, some days I do even better than manage. I'm about a year and a half from that survival benchmark. The cancer still lurks in the far reaches of my body waiting. Every ache or symptom I have makes, you, makes me question if this is it, if it's returned to get me. So I live with that every day. I live with a death sentence, but I do live. I live with my three amazing sons and their love and joy. I live with my husband's love and the life we have together. I live with the love of beer, coffee, amusement parks, Disney and Harry Potter. I live with my amazingly loving tribe of friends. I live with the love of my mom and the memory of a dad who loved me so damn much. I live with my sister and brother-in-law and my new baby nephew who exudes love with each precious baby giggle. I live with a job I love, teaching students I love, and a city I love. I live. Thank you. That is another Van First Timer. Laura Brooks, everybody. I recently read that for 2,280 days of a woman's life, she has her period. <laughs> sure, my body's an amazing machine that needs tending to, but damn, over 2,000 days of bleeding is bound to mess with my love life. I work in education, and as a result, I have three weeks of vacation every Christmas. At first, I would go home to New York City, but after a few cranky holidays, I realized I hate being cold and away from nature. And no matter how much self-development I did as a single person, the holidays always felt like the Olympics of singleness, hurtling around families and couples everywhere. So one year, I ditched my Christmas trip for a solo beach vacation, and no one seemed to notice. Now, every Christmas, I get to create my own traditions in warm tropical spots that fill up my soul. There was one problem. Whenever I would travel to a beautiful beach and meet a cute guy, my period would show up. <laughs> my period became the biggest buzzkill of my life. I started to think back to the Old Testament from my Catholic upbringing. The story goes that Eve was cursed with bleeding every month after she defied God by eating the apple. And because of this curse, we are clean and unclean depending on the time of the month. I'm not Catholic anymore, but I did start to wonder if all of these coincidences were turning into my own sort of curse. The first time nature interrupted my love life was in Costa Rica at a yoga and surf retreat. This is where I met Carlos, my surf instructor. He had a gorgeous muscled body and a, was a fair bit older than me and spoke English. For our sur surf lessons, four of us hiked 45 minutes with Carlos into the jungle to a little surf shack. He unlocked the tiny cabin, grabbed us surfboards, and off we went for a few hours. I got to know Carlos well and secretly named him Human Xanax for his unbelievable sense of calm. One afternoon, we grabbed lunch together after surfing. I found myself sitting across from shirtless, hot Carlos making polite conversation while X-rated images of us together kept flashing across my mind's eye. Then New Year's Eve came along. It was my last day of surfing and I woke up with my period. I thought about the surf shack. There was no running water and I hadn't seen a bathroom either. There was no other option than to tell Carlos my situation. 
I stumbled on and on to Carlos, and he calmly replied, no problem. I opened the shack for you, and you changed the tampon. After surfing, everyone waited while I changed my tampon in a tiny hot shack before we put away the surfboards. We hiked back into town and made a plan to all meet up that evening for New Year's. After a nap and dinner, I put on a skirt and headed to the bar. The village had transformed with music and dancing in the streets. I danced the night away too, eventually making my way into Carlos's arms. By 3 a.m., Carlos kissed me and I was floored. It was the best kiss of my life. It was as if Carlos had all the time in the world to simply kiss me. I wasn't ready to go home quite yet, so I suggested a swim. Carlos led me to a secret ocean pool carved into the rocks. I took off all my clothes and jumped in. He sat nearby and watched as I floated around. After climbing out, I stood there completely naked while Carlos went through a detailed list of all the things we could and could not do because I was on my period. <laughs> it was like an Old Testament listing of clean versus unclean all over again. <laughs> Oral sex for me, unclean. Oral sex for him, clean. <laughs> Regular sex, unclean. And on he went. I felt like I was back in my weekly Catholic Bible class. I later learned that over 75% of Costa Ricans are Catholic. So maybe Carlos was reciting options from his own classes. Either way, his ideas about periods brought back those feelings of shame about having a female body. For a few moments, I felt guilty that it was my body that was the problem. But those outdated ideas slowly faded away, and I saw Carlos as old for the first time. At first, his age difference seemed exciting, but now he just seemed old fashioned. I shimmied my way back into my clothes and let him walk me home. A year later, I was again in Costa Rica. It was Christmas Eve and there was an outdoor restaurant nearby that was serving dinner. I sat at the bar and soon met Doug, a pilot who was 10 years older than me. Doug was a hot, half Jamaican, half white, muscular guy. The attraction felt instant and soon we were chatting the night away. Doug was Canadian and true to being unfailingly nice. Before I knew it, he was buying me ice cream and making sure another girl who was drunk got home safely. We exchanged emails and a few days later, he visited me for New Year's. We planned a beach day and I woke up with my period. <laughs> Two hours into the day, I realized that with no bathrooms at the beach, I needed Doug to drive me to a pay toilet. I told him my period situation and he proceeded to get emotional, put his hand over his heart and say, I'm so honored you told me. I imagined Doug as the exact opposite of Carlos. He would see my monthly bleeding as a sign of power that I could carry a life and birth it into the world. He would probably buy me a menstrual journal and tell me about the divine feminine within me. I had come a long way in accepting my female body, but I clearly wasn't at Doug's level yet. Doug's response to my period reminded me of the confusing ideas the Catholic Church has about women. Women's sexuality is viewed as dangerous, but also revered for the sacred ability to create life. So I let Doug travel on to the next town without me. This year, to usher in a new decade, I flew to Australia for some fun in the sun. One afternoon, I passed a bar advertising a 90s hip hop night. I pushed myself to go for it and happily danced the night away. At the end of the night, I found myself next to a bearded cute guy who would lock eyes with me and smile. He introduced himself as Julian from France. I gave him my number and proposed a beach day. I didn't tell him it was a gay nude beach. He was French, so I figured the nude part wouldn't phase him. The next morning I woke up and I had my period. This was truly starting to feel like a curse. But by now I knew the drill. I grabbed a handful of tampons and picked up Julian. He walked to my car in a tank top, board shorts, and a quick silver hat. 
He was a compact Frenchman, maybe an inch taller than me and muscular. We drove up a cliff, parked, and then hiked down 30 minutes to a wild and stunning beach. We saw a few naked guys, but they seemed to say, stay to their side of the beach. After we swam in the ocean, I lay down next to him, and my eyes followed the pattern of tattoos over his muscles. I thought about the stereotype of Frenchmen as the world's best lovers as I fell asleep in the sun. After a few hours, I mentioned to Julian that I had to go to the bathroom. Again, no facilities, no running water, no woods. He pointed to the ocean, and I said that it's not exactly that, that I had my period. With his heavy French accent, he waved his muscular arm, pursed his lips together in a distinctly French way, and said, well, that is just natural. <laughs> no list of clean or unclean, no elevated honor, just the comment that it's natural. I sat there in that surreal, gorgeous environment and thought back to what I knew from health class. There was an egg, some uterine lining, and all of this tied to a 28-day cycle of bleeding somehow. And my cycle must have me bleeding around New Year's each year, which coincided with vacation. It's just a bodily function. But yet, since it's distinctly female, it's layered with this weird shame. I looked around and saw endless sand, and then I did something my younger Catholic self would be appalled by. I told Julian not to turn around, squatted down, and changed a tampon. I still wasn't exactly ready for a menstrual journal. I mean, most former Catholics spend decades unraveling shame and guilt, but I was ready to let go of the idea of Eve being cursed, and by default, my own curse. If Eve does exist in some other space and time, I hope she could see, she could have seen a woman that day on a stunning beach with a hot French man, just simply letting her body do its thing. Thank you. Hey there, this is Drew. Uh, coming in to say hello to everybody here at the So Say We All Expanded Universe Online Edition, VAMP. Um, just wanted to say that we miss everybody at the Whistle Stop, uh, and we miss being the Whistle Stop as well. So uh, we've been talking lots about what it will be like when we come back into play, and we're excited about some new things we could do there with you guys. Um, it's been a while since I've seen everybody, and I certainly have gained a few things in the last couple of months that might lead to a story in the future uh but yeah after just to convey to everybody i wanted to say thank you for all the well wishes that i got when i contracted the covid 19 coronavirus everyone has been so kind many people from vamp um, actually some of the things i was able to share media related that were positive uh, came from people from the VAMP community. So I want to say thank you for that. It was an opportunity that you guys gave to me. Um, so just to say hello and to give a little, <laughs> a friendly face of some kind uh, from home. And uh, I guess also I would, maybe it might be a decent time to talk about writers getting together to push against the totalitarianism of the word unprecedented. How about a new word? And maybe vamp, it can start at vamp and in the So Say We All family to figure out another word besides fucking unprecedented, aberrant, unexampled, singular, uh, call it the new apocalypse remarkable, incredible, something else. Call it novel. See? See what I did there? Novel. Anyway, change can start with you. And Hand sanitizer also. Okay. Isn't he wonderful? I take him everywhere. 
Thanks, Justin. So, did you enjoy the first half of the show? <laughs> Weren't they great? We hope you at home are enjoying also. We hope you're drinking. And to be in the true spirit of our usual whistle stop shows, we hope you're passing your glasses forward. So, uh, <laughs> and uh, yes, we uh, please also throw your glasses on the ground, break something uh, for it to be also just like a whistle stop experience. Huzzah. 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 <laughs> so, we are going to continue now with the second half of our show, and we would like to please bring up Mr. David Schmidt. Yeah. I've heard a lot of unpleasant news in my day. No, David, Sylvia doesn't want to dance with you. Your grandma died, David. Trump just won Florida. <laughs> the worst news, though, came from a middle-aged Russian, Russian nurse. David, ложись на кровать. Держи жопу и раздвигай ягодицы. Which translated is, David, you need to curl up in the fetal position, grab both butt cheeks, and spread them apart. <laughs> When I moved to Russia in 2003, I didn't plan on getting penetrated with a rubber hose. I was there to save souls for Jesus. I worked with a Russian Baptist church, pushing an agenda I had inherited from the most anal retentive pastors of my home church. After a year in the town of Saratov, I became disenchanted with the evangelical savior complex. I wondered who I was supposed to save in the first place. What was the point of planting churches in a land that was already Christian? I became a maverick missionary and decided to simply get to know people and appreciate their traditions. I grew close to the Latin American medical students in Saratov. I started hanging around the local Catholic parish and drank beer with the Mexican nuns who worked there. I began to feel at home. Things were looking up. Then I got sick. Beware you who live in the age of coronavirus. Getting sick isn't just a matter of what germs you're exposed to. No, it's about how well protected you are. I had tempted fate for a year in Russia <laughs> with no consequence. I embraced diseased homeless dudes. I slept on the ground in the woods. I ate raw fish and eggs. The whole time, my immune system remained robust. The Russian mystery bug waited until my defenses were at their lowest to launch an attack. In April 2004, a year into my stay, I had to leave to renew my visa. The closest and easiest country was Estonia, a former Soviet republic. I spent a week hanging out in the capital city of Tallinn, drinking Pilsner on medieval castle walls, chatting with the locals about the Soviet invasions that they had suffered. Meanwhile, the mystery bug sent sleeper agents into my bloodstream. Subversive guerrilla scouts building jungle outposts, waiting for the infrastructure to weaken. And weaken it did. After several days in Estonia, I learned that my visa would take an extra week. I also learned that my bank account was empty. I wouldn't get another deposit until May. I was officially a bum in Estonia. <laughs> I packed up my backpack and moved out of the cozy youth hostel and into the less cozy public park. <laughs> Let me tell you, April nights in Estonia get very cold when you spend them outside. I put on all of my socks and all my shirts and I still shivered on the park bench. For nourishment, I gnawed on a salami I had bought when I arrived. When my Russian visa was approved, I used the last of my cash to take the cheapest possible transport back to Saratov. Hard, upright seats on a series of buses and trains that traveled at night across the wilderness. I was so relieved to get back to my apartment where I had a jar of Kopec coins I'd been saving. Pooled together, they equaled a couple bucks, enough to buy a loaf of black bread that would sustain me till the next deposit came in. Sleeping outside, poor nutrition, stress, my defenses were down. That's when the enemy attacked. I went to the Saratov Public Library shortly after returning to give a talk about foreign aggression in Estonia. All the while, 
The mystery disease rolled into me like a thousand red army tanks through the streets of Tallinn. I felt faint when I left the library. I walked home and was drenched in sweat. I called one of the Mexican nuns who worked in the church. No mames, hermana. I don't feel so good. Spiritually? No. Me siento de la chingada, hermana. I feel seriously fucked up, sister. She sent my Colombian friend, Fabiana, to check on me. Fabiana was in her second year of medical school. When she walked into my apartment, her mouth dropped open. Oh, you look like shit, David. Let's call a real doctor. A Russian MD from the public clinic made a house call and took my temperature. It's pretty high, he said in Russian, showing Fabiana the thermometer. But at least he's not at brain damage levels yet. No, pues, I murmured weak, weakly. No, pues, menos mal, cabrón. The doctor looked over his glasses at Fabiana. Is he speaking in tongues? I switched back to Russian. No, doctor, что за диагноз? So what's the diagnosis, doc? Uh, not sure yet. What color is your matcha? He's asked, using the medical term for feces, matcha. Lately, I replied, dark, nearly black. His eyebrows went up. Black? Are you sure? I think I would know, Doc. <laughs> he looked at his thermometer again, and then at my pale face, and then at Fabiana. You might need hospitalization. I tried to fight it off on my own. I failed. After a week of fever and delirium, my Russian friend Marina came by with a pot of borscht. Oh, you look really bad, David. How bad? Huyova, she said, which literally means as bad as a dick. <laughs> Are you ready to go to the hospital yet? I nodded feebly and mumbled a mixture of languages. I'm ready for it, cabrona. <laughs> Marina called for an ambulance and helped me pack my things. The public hospitals here are pretty bare bones, she warned me. You need to bring all your own supplies, bed sheets, plate, cup, everything. A battered old van showed up with a single wooden bench in the back. I shivered and tried not to fall over on the sharp turns. We parked and Marina half carried me to the intake desk. The nurse looked me up and down severely and handed me a glass jar. I need a sample of your matcha, she said sternly. <laughs> At your service, madame, I said in English. One fecal sample coming right up. She pointed at a door behind me. I walked in and found a dark broom closet. Not even a toilet or a roll of toilet paper. <sighs> Talk about bare bones. How am I supposed to squeeze out any matcha in here? So I positioned myself on the cement floor, tripod style, and I held the jar underneath me. Eventually, I had my sample. I wiped with a napkin from my pocket, tossed it on the floor, and walked out holding the jar. The nurse looked up and her face transformed. She laughed, really laughed. Big, heaving belly guffaws, very un-Russian nurse-like. <laughs> Finally, she said, with tears streaming down her face, that's not what I wanted from you. And that was when I learned that matcha doesn't actually mean feces. <laughs> I was wrong. Matcha is the Russian word for urine. <laughs> Marina gave me an, a sympathetic look as I held a jar with an entirely unnecessary turd <laughs> sitting in it. I filled out my intake paperwork and I said goodbye to Marina. I put the sheets on my bed, unpacked my things, and lay down to finally get some rest. A nurse walked in to take my temperature. Okay, I said when she left, now I can get some sleep. Ten minutes later, another nurse came in to give me an injection. Okay, now I can get some sleep. A minute later, two more nurses. I looked up. Now what? One of them held a floppy rubber bladder attached to a long tube. Oh, neat, I thought. They brought me a nutritious shake to drink. I smiled and held out my glass for them to serve me. The stone-faced nurse shook her head. Take off your trousers. I dutifully pulled them down, curious now. Okay, they must be here to wash off my legs with that hose. But where will the runoff water go? 
and your underwear. I push deeper into denial as I remove my boxers. Okay, they're going to spray down my butthole <laughs> to clean it. But still, where will the water go? I sat back down on the edge of the bed. The nurse huffed and said the dreaded phrase. Curl up in the fetal position, grab both butt cheeks, and spread them apart. I stared incredulous. We need to clean you out, the other nurse said unceremoniously. Standard procedure. And in they went. <laughs> sad, sad moment. I can't claim to understand for one second the trauma of someone who experiences sexual violence. I will say this, though. As I felt that cold water enter me, filling my insides with its foreign chill, one thought filled my mind. Nobody should have to bear a pregnancy they didn't ask for. <laughs> the nurse told me to bear my own water pregnancy for five minutes. I waited four and a half. I pooped out the mess and returned to my cot, defeated and utterly empty, and fell into a black and dreamless sleep. The next morning, I realized I was in full quarantine isolation. My only human contacts were the nurses and doctors who came into my room for exams, questions, treatments, pills, injections. They launched a full frontal attack on the mystery disease. Day and night, they injected my ass with the best medicine Russian has to offer. Now, I'm not saying ass colloquially. Everything went into my butt. Suppositories, injections in the butt cheek, several more ent enemas. I don't want to make any psychological assumptions about the fathers of Soviet medicine, but they had some major unresolved butt issues. I couldn't complain, though. The medicine was working. I slowly crept back from the brink of death. When I got over the fever and delirium, I realized just how boring an empty hospital room can be. No TV set, no books. One cot, one table, one chair. Food was sparse and bland. Flavorless porridge for breakfast, watery potato soup for lunch and dinner. After four days, I wondered how long I could take it. And then my friends rallied around me. The Mexican nuns went to my apartment to pick up a couple books for my sanity's sake. Dios te bendiga, David. They called out to me from across the hall that separated me from the healthy. I looked out the window in my door and waved back. Mil gracias, hermanas. Son unas chingonas. You sisters are real badasses. <laughs> my Nicaraguan friend, Dorian, put credit on my little Nokia cell phone. I texted Fabiana and sent her my parents' home number. Can you please call my viejos? Tell them my butthole hurts, but I'm alive. <laughs> she texted back, will do but I'm skipping the butthole part. People brought groceries to break up the monotony of my diet. The Colombians brought tomatoes and cucumbers. The Russian Baptist brought a roasted chicken. When a nurse said that it wasn't allowed, they did the Christian thing and lied about it. <laughs> they hid it inside a tin under a bed of mashed potatoes. I was touched by their effort. I bet they would have brought it inside of their butts if, they, if I had asked them to. Marina continued to check in on me via phone and in person, as did dozens of other friends, Orthodox, Protestant, Catholic Christians, atheists, Jewish folks, Muslim Tartars. I had come to Russia to save souls, and this community of people saved my life. I had come to teach people what to believe, and they taught me that the only thing worth believing in, the deep power of love, real human love, fierce and loyal. They breached the walls of my quarantine for one simple reason. I was a person in need. In doing so, they breached our self-imposed human quarantines of language, creed, and politics and came together, working as one body. And that's what saved me. In the end, it's the only hope of saving any of us. Some people discover this transformative love at a time of personal tragedy, a natural disaster or a death in the family. Me, I discovered this love in my time of enemas. And it's still up inside of me to this day.
My eyes shoot open and suddenly I am gasping for air. It feels like an elephant is crushing my chest. I inhale sharply and my torso goes into spasms. I shift my body to stop the twitching. Nothing is helping. My sobbing becomes violent, causing me to choke and gasp. Why can't I breathe? I ran five miles last night. I was fine. What is happening? I reach for my phone to call my boyfriend. It's his birthday. He's a paramedic. He left me this morning for his shift. He should know what's happening. Spencer answers immediately. I can't breathe. Something is wrong. He says, don't call the paramedics. They won't be able to help you. Go straight to the emergency room and tell them you have chest pains. They'll admit you immediately. My, ma my mom drives me to the ER at Kaiser off Mission Gorge. Spencer's right. I am given a bed immediately. But for the next seven hours, I am told nothing is wrong, that it's probably just gas, and I'm accused of doing this for attention. They tell me I'll go home soon. Soon never comes. Something called a D-dimer, which indicates blood clots, comes back positive on my tests. The threshold is 500. My levels are 501. The doctor assures me it's a false positive, being that I'm a healthy 22-year-old. He orders a CT scan, just to be sure, which means a lot more waiting in even colder rooms and an injection of colored dye into my veins. The doctor finally returns this time with urgency. It's a pulmonary embolism. You need to be admitted immediately. My world as a healthy young woman implodes. I spiral into devastation for how I was dismissed all afternoon. The staff admits if the embolism went undetected any longer, it would have been fatal. I call my boyfriend with the news and I apologize for ruining his birthday. Every day for three months, I visit Kaiser for blood tests to regulate my INR levels. My veins are collapsed and my arms so bruised I look like a junkie. I can't drink because of the blood thinners. I can't exercise because yoga leaves me breathless and covered in painful bruises. Working full time leaves me fatigued. I start having blackouts with no memory of how I got home from work that day. I research memory loss on my own. It's linked to the warfarin I am taking, which I also learn is rat poison. When I tell my doctor, he refuses that they're connected. He orders seizure tests, brain scans, exposes me to even more radiation, and threatens to take my driver's license if they can't find the uh, cause of my blackouts. One morning after labs, I sit sobbing in my car. I'm exhausted and fucking angry. I'm 22 years old. This is a terrible way to live. I'm reminded by every receptionist, doctor, nurse, and lab technician how lucky I am to be alive, and yet I feel like an empty vessel of wasted potential. I'm trapped in a failing body that should be carrying me through the best years of my life. I call out sick from work, which I never do, and I drive home instead. I dig out a journal I started when I was 17 years old. Inside is a bucket list of a hundred things. Jump out of an airplane, backpack through Europe, sleep in a tree in the rainforest, slow dance on a glacier, teach English to a Buddhist monk. Far-fetched as they are, I am reminded there's so much I dreamed I would do. And at that moment, I became the yes woman. <laughs> I jumped out of the airplane. I started performing stand-up comedy. I rode in a hot air balloon. I even got a job as a karaoke host despite being tone deaf because why the fuck not? <laughs> <laughs> On December 16th, 2012, I saw a post in the comedian's Facebook group from someone named Guam Felix. I need eight comics that want to be on Let's Make a Deal with Wayne Brady in Hollywood. <laughs> I had never heard of the show before, but that sounds awesome. So with zero inhibitions, I drove to LA at 4 a.m. four days later to join a man I knew only from show flyers on the internet. <laughs> In a scramble that morning, I pulled on bright green leggings and a green tunic from a Peter Pan costume I wore for Halloween. I found a Christmas hat with elf ears glued on that I think my mom bought from a gas station. <laughs> So I'm dressed as an elf standing on the corner of Sunset and Venice in Hollywood. A homeless man is pissing on the brick wall next to me, and I have to remind myself I am the spectacle in this situation, not him. 
<laughs> I was feeling insecure about the spontaneous decision questioning my sanity and my safety. Suddenly, I see this jolly Asian man dressed as a court jester, waving excitedly my direction. Guam's bear hug and joyous energy flooded me with relief for trusting a total stranger on the internet. The line for ticket holders was already wrapping around the gates of Sunset Bronson Studios. As we walked to the end of the line, my cheeks felt flush seeing identical costumes to what I was wearing. There were about 10 other elves and a few Santas. Real fucking original, Haley. Come to a Christmas taping dress as an elf. You really nailed this one. <laughs> Fuming with embarrassment, I realized we hadn't been joined by anyone else. So uh, how many other comedians are coming? He tells me I am the only person who followed through. <laughs> Which meant we were in this together. Two strangers dressed like imbeciles, freezing cold in a line of costume-clad contestants, hoping for their 15 minutes of fortune, I guess. I decided to embrace the day for the wild ride it was turning out to be. We checked in with the studio staff, were given a number and a name tag, and corralled into a room with empty chairs. Show producers sat at the front with their backs to us, interviewing groups of contestants. State your name, where are you from, what do you do for a living? I was too overwhelmed by the observations to be enthusiastic in my responses. There was a woman dressed as a giant stack of Christmas presents talking to a guy in a gorilla suit. There was a hula dancer next to a caveman. I think I saw a Dalmatian do a cartwheel. And there was most definitely a giant chicken. So <laughs> once we entered the studio, it became a sea of dancing, twerking, twisting, flailing costume bodies. This is the part I didn't know or expect. Those commercial breaks on television are actually wild dance parties. <laughs> the producers watch from mirrored windows the whole time, and Guam and I are having a blast banging our bodies to 80s classics, but my injured lungs remind me I should probably pace myself a little bit. <laughs> One 50-minute episode took five hours. <laughs> Neither of us gets picked, and we're about to leave the lot when an assistant asks us to stay for a second taping. We had nowhere to go dressed like this, so we stayed, this time being positioned near the stage. Now, when a new contestant is brought up for the game, for a game on Let's Make a Deal, you're either called by name because Big Brother has been watching you sweat your ass off for the last two hours, or you get the attention of the host, Sir Wayne Brady, and he calls you by costume. <laughs> Now, you're discouraged from jumping and shouting during taping, so I imagined myself to be 10 feet taller than anyone else in the room. Wayne entered the crowd, and I did everything I could to get his attention. Just as he was about to point to a man in a toga, we locked eyes from across the room. And it must have been Christmas magic, but his finger whips my direction, and Wayne Brady says, Elf, come with me. <laughs> Have you ever blacked out because so much adrenaline is coursing through your body? <laughs> I have a vague memory of what happened, but I do know some basics. <laughs> I sprinted to the stage to join a second contestant. Our game was the dice duel. The numbers 2 to 12 reveal a dollar amount added to your bank when rolled. If you roll a number twice, the game is over. You can trade in a free roll card for another toss of the dice. Simple enough. Sort of. <laughs> the game should have gone quickly, but we gave the audience a proper showdown. With each successful roll, our heart rates doubled and our banks increased. At one point, I used my free roll card when Wayne proposed an offer. Well, that's one option. You could give that back to me, or I could just give you $300 to quit, because one of you is going home with nothing. I pretended to be in a conundrum, but like, what are the chances of getting selected for a game show ever again? <laughs> So uh, I shouted, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep playing. Like, yeah, keep playing. Cool. <laughs> I jumbled the oversized dice in my hands, expelling air from my blowfish cheeks as if that would somehow bring more luck to this situation. The dice tumbled down the ramp, but I didn't see where they landed. My eyes were tightly closed and both hands cramped twisted into a lucky cross of the fingers. In his best announcer voice, Wayne Brady announces my 10, followed by... 
$1,300. I opened my eyes screaming. <laughs> my broke ass college student mind couldn't comprehend the possibility of going home with almost five grand. <laughs> All that remained are, uh, were the numbers two, four, eight, and 12. When Nicholas rolled another nine, he rejected Wayne's offer to forfeit and used his free roll card instead. He wasn't going down with the fight either. I waved my arms toward the crowd like I was trying to incite the wave in a ball game. I crossed my fingers again and blocked my eyes. Nicholas rolled another three, putting an end to the game. I'm flash dancing as fast as my little legs will allow when Bray Wayne says, freak out even more, you didn't dress like this to be serious. So I let out the most sincere scream I didn't even know was possible within my little body. Then came the twist. He offered me curtain number three if I gave up the money. I looked to Guam and he's rubbing with his fingertips and I knew he was right. I'll take the money, I will take the money. <laughs> and good thing, because the prize was a piece of shit paper mache vacuum cleaner better known as a zonk on the show. <laughs> right? Uh, we cut to commercial break and immediately Wayne disappeared from the audience or from the studio. No audience interaction, no congratulations, just poof, gone. And as soon as I sat down, all color drained from my face. Everyone around me was electric, but I was exhausted, overwhelmed, and I felt like I was about to be pumped. I don't remember anything else from the taping. All I could think about was which debt I should pay off first. I was escorted to a shaggy office to sign an NDA. You're not allowed to tell a single person about the results of the show until it airs. And you have to wait six weeks after that to receive your prize. I had $4,600 coming my way, but I had no idea when that would be. Guam and I stopped somewhere for a burrito and I checked the balance of my account. I had $62 to my name. I was both the poorest and the wealthiest I had ever been and it made the sinking feeling even worse. <laughs> When I got back to San Diego, I had to tell someone. <laughs> my best friend Jimmy was always the person to support my craziest ideas, so I told him I wanted to travel instead of paying off my debt. Unfazed, he said, where would you go? Having never left the country, I'm from East County, by the way, <laughs> the first person to cross my mind was a foreign exchange student I met in college. I think I'll go to Germany. I went home that night and booked a one-way ticket to Frankfurt. The episode finally aired on April 17th, 2013, the day before the anniversary of my pulmonary embolism. Uh, I traveled to Heidelberg for my 24th birthday in July, as well as Paris, Amsterdam, and Dublin. It was the backpacking trip to birth the world traveler I am to this day. Two years later, again with Jimmy's encouragement, I dropped out of my last semester of college, sold my karaoke business, and studied orangutans in the rainforest of Sumatra. When I returned home from my travels, I met a woman who suffered from a pulmonary embolism on the exact same day, two years before I did. Bonded by our tragedy, she invited me to Myanmar to shoot a documentary on Buddhist nuns. Two years after that, in need of intense healing, I returned to Sumatra and then Myanmar and in a hot air balloon over the temples of Bagan, a man named Jimmy, who wasn't supposed to be in my balloon, would introduce me to the love of my life a few days later. There was no way for me to understand the magnitude of what that pulmonary embolism set into motion. The last eight years is like a single string and a roll of yarn tossed over and under and around every hurdle, battleground, tragedy, peak and plateau. Above, it appears to be a tangled mess, but when I follow that single thread, I realize it never snagged. It was never not intact between this exact moment and the one in the hospital bed eight years ago. Everything was leading me right here. It shouldn't have taken death for me to make my wildest dreams come true, but looking back on this moment now, I am so fucking grateful that it did. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Our stomachs lurched as we sat in the rickety colectivo van that would take us to a pueblo deep in the Sierra Norte region of Oaxaca. 
the region where the famous curandera Maria Sabina first introduced Westerners to magic mushrooms. Many tourists came to this town to consume los hongos magicos, and we were no exception. Angela and I were two recent college graduates living in Oaxaca on Fulbright teaching grants. She was a blonde, extroverted, Ivy League educated New England woman who struck me as privileged and fake. I was an introverted Chicana from California. Three months into our nine month stay in Oaxaca, we were going through the waves of culture shock together, switching from being incredibly enamored with Oaxaca's kind people, constant fiestas, parades, and delicious cuisine, to being annoyed with the slow Wi-Fi, unreliable plumbing, and people's inability to get anywhere on time. Our friendship felt forced and like it would not have happened under normal circumstances. She had made dozens of new friends in Oaxaca and I had only made a few. Her Spanish was as good as mine despite the fact that I had grown up speaking it and she had studied it. Her blonde hair and piercing blue eyes attracted admiring glances from many of the locals and more cat calls than I can count. I found myself feeling both jealous of the attention she got and proud of myself that I was a less conspicuous, not obviously American traveler. As we sat in the van, I thought of all the meticulous research that I had done on hallucinogenic drugs. <laughs> I'm a very cautious person, perhaps due to my sheltered fundamentalist upbringing that taught me that indigenous traditions were the work of the devil. I also knew that the possibility of a bad trip was very real. Once at a party, I saw a girl screaming that she was being attacked by giant spiders. She screamed in agony and frantically tried to kill them, but they kept coming. It looked like a nightmare. But here, in the homeland of Maria Sabina, with the indigenous shamans of Oaxaca, who had worked with the plant medicine for generations, I decided that the setting was right. I was very attracted to indigenous belief systems that honored the sacred feminine, which stood in stark contrast to the angry male god that I had been raised with. Angela had come with me willingly, always happy to just throw herself into any new adventure. The deeper our van wound into the Sierra Norte forest, the more we left the linear notion of time behind us in Oaxaca City. The lush green mountains were laced with vines, bell-shaped flowers, and thick, moist trees whose trunks took on the shapes of different animals. One tree in the region, the Tule tree, is actually famous for all of the images of animals that are naturally visible on its gnarled trunk. Our driver slowed down as the road became covered by an immense fog. He assured us that we would, that we would arrive in 20 minutes, mas o menos, he had told us this multiple times and it had been three hours. <laughs> no, really, how much longer? About two more hours, he said. We tell you Americans 20 minutes because you're always in such a hurry. He wasn't wrong. After three more hours on the winding path, we finally saw the welcome sign with a big red mushroom next to it. <laughs> The taxi van pulled up to the one paved road that led to the center of town. As we stepped out of the rickety white van, it felt as if we were stepping onto a gigantic mountain ledge. It quickly disappeared into the fog after we stepped out. The main square of the Pueblo, blurred by fog, consisted of a few artisan vendors, a fruit stand, and a cafe built right where the ledge ended. As Angela and I walked across the plaza to the cafe, everything about us felt clunky and out of place in comparison to the natives who moved with lightness. No wonder the Zapotecs are called the people of the clouds in their mythology. Our lungs struggled to adjust to the altitude as we wobbled into the warm cafe. It was lined with wooden panels and pictures of all kinds of mushroom species. Buenos días, güeras, said the woman behind the counter. Siéntense donde quieran. ¿Qué les doy? Café, chocolate. No sooner had we ordered our coffee and sat down that Angela made eye contact with some blonde backpackers sitting a few tables down from us. They looked as if they had found what we were looking for. 
the telepathy that comes with a trip on magic mushrooms had already started to kick in. Right, they answered with a distinct Liverpool accent to a question that we hadn't asked out loud. Come sit with us, we'll tell you where to find them. <laughs> Within a few minutes, we had the contact information of a local shaman who performed ceremonies. Before the backpackers caught the next train back to the city, they assured us that a bad trip in this place would be impossible. Three hours later, we were sitting around a fire on the shaman's property, our body still wet from the steamy herbal sweat lodge that we had just come out of. We warmed our hands on the fire and focused on what we wanted our intention to be. The shaman recommended that we keep it simple, just a mantra of a word or two that we could come back to if our thoughts accidentally took us to a dark place that we did not want to go. Healing was the first word that came to me. Do not be afraid, said the shaman. His dark eyes were very serious, yet kind. He reminded us again that this was medicine, meant to be respected and not played with. He chanted an indigenous prayer that would have sent my religious fundamentalist mother running into the hills. <laughs> I had come a long way from leaving the Jehovah's Witnesses, I thought to myself. I had grown up not celebrating any holidays, knocking on doors every weekend to save as many souls as I could before God's imminent judgment day. When I had left the religion at the age of 18, I was full of hatred for it. While my sister hardly remembers anything about our upbringing, I remember many details. Visions of Armageddon, which we were told we would only survive if we followed all of the rules. Sitting for hours, being told how dangerous the world was outside. There was no Sunday school, no youth groups, and no fun. Nothing to look forward to except the end of the world. <laughs> <laughs> We were socialized to behave like little adults, whose main goal was to spread the propaganda. My sister, who also left the religion, is married, works a solid nine to five job, and has a child. She doesn't remember very much about the past, and she doesn't want to. She urges me to move forward with my life as she has. This was by far the craziest thing that I had ever done towards that end. Keep your thoughts on your intention on Mother Nature, the shaman's steady voice said as he waved his staff over the fire. Given my history of anxiety, there were many different ways this could go. I thought back to the bad trip of the girl at the party being attacked by spiders, <laughs> but I would not turn back now. Angela and I drank our tea and ingested the six moist brown mushrooms at the bottom of our cups, the equivalent of three grams of psilocybin, the standard dose, although the shrooms in this region are especially potent. And now, the shaman said, you wait. Or some people like to hike up that mountain over there to catch the sunset. Let's climb the mountain, Amanda said, <laughs> jumping up. Angela said, jumping up. We ingested a drug that neither of us has just taken, and you want to go on a hike? Remember the last time we got lost when we hiked? You won't get lost, the shaman said. The path is very clear. It will only take about 20 minutes. <laughs> we both knew that 20 minutes could mean anything between 30 minutes and two hours. And Angela was already walking toward the path. You must do what feels right for you, the shaman's eyes seemed to tell me, although he did not speak. I knew he was right, but I still followed Amanda. As we walked through the dense foliage, the color started to get brighter. I had never realized there were so many different shades of green. My steps began to get slow as I felt the weight of the earth pulling me down and telling me to listen. I felt a slight nausea and the thought entered my mind, this must be what it feels like to be pregnant. How nice. A very strange thought to have for someone who has vowed never to have kids. <laughs> I wanted to walk slowly and reevaluate my decision never to have kids. But Angela wanted to get to the top of the mountain. We passed a dead mouse in the middle of the road. I wanted to stop, admire its fuzzy white fur coat, and contemplate that a sentient being had taken its last breath here. <laughs> but Angela wanted to get to the top of the mountain. 
I wanted to merge with the moss of the trees that had turned gold and rearranged itself into smiling faces. And when I started to worry, the moss darkened and the color began to look scary. So I kept my thoughts on my intention to heal and the moss continued to smile at me. <laughs> but Angela wanted to get to the top of the mountain. As we walked forward, I felt myself, I, I felt the voice of Mother Nature growing stronger. The image of Pachamama, an Andean goddess who I had read about and seen painted on murals appeared before me. I understood that she was merely a projection of my mind because I had read about her, but her power was very real. She would heal me if I let her, if I stepped out of my perfectionism, hatred, and people-pleasing tendencies and just listened, really listened. The sunlight had already begun to fade and I did not want to spend the remaining precious hours of daylight in a rush to get to the top of the mountain. Angela, I want to stay right here. We had come to a lovely plateau, an open clearing that was definitely not part of the path that we had veered off of some time ago. <laughs> Angela agreed reluctantly as she was starting to feel the effects of the mushrooms too. She was bouncy and energized, even for Amanda, even for Angela. But she was trying very hard to stay in control, something that isn't really possible in the world of tripping. <laughs> she paced frantically and remarked with panic that everything looked as if it were a gigantic cartoon, and she didn't know how she felt about it. <laughs> Mother Nature began to show me images of my childhood the cold hardwood floors of the house I grew up in, the Bible books neatly arranged, of me as a frightened, angry little girl in a dress who threatened her peers with Armageddon, <laughs> who was so afraid of displeasing her mom, who appeared as a distant icy figure. The adult in me was furious that my inner child had endured such pain. But Pachamama was here, urging me to surrender it all to her, and when I did, the healing that I had come for happened naturally. The pain lifted. I was not the frightened little girl anymore. I was here in this beautiful forest connecting with my ancestors. Angela was having insights of her own as she slowed down, realizing that she did not need to be in a hurry all the time, that her whole fixation with getting to the top was an illusion and that where we were here right now was actually the top. We confided in each other about our childhood scars, our worries, our fears, about having no real idea what we wanted to do with the rest of our lives. I learned that she had lost her mother to lung cancer when she was 17 and had an abusive stepfather. We realized we held ourselves back from our dreams of writing and created music and lied to ourselves that we were happy with our jobs as teachers. And it was okay to be sad sometimes and to admit that we weren't happy, even though we live in a society that teaches us to repress negative emotions. I told her that I hadn't liked her at first because I was jealous of her ability to make friends everywhere she went. She told me that she was jealous of my ability to make real friends. We sank deeper into the dirt, which sparkled in hues of golden brown for what felt like hours. It was hard to tell. Night had fallen and the drug was beginning to wear off, but the presence of Pachamama was not. By the time we got back to our lodge near the shaman's hut, we had gotten lost twice. We were two giggly Americans whose hair and clothes were covered in dirt that no longer sparkled, and we were okay with it. That is our show, everybody. So let's hear it for all of our performers one more time. We have Gabby Gonzalez. We have Laura Brooks. We have Ginger Nocera, David Schmidt, Haley Rutledge, Ariana Krieger. Uh, who did I leave out? Did I leave anybody out? 
think that's everybody. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. You did so wonderful. Thank you at home for watching. We hope you enjoyed the show. We love that Vamp is back uh, in a personal manner. And thank you again so much for joining us. And we hope to see you all soon. Thanks so much. And see. And see. <laughs>